joining us today for this inaugural webinar with Source Fabric, our 10th year of operation. My name is Greg Bruno. I am a communication manager here at Source Fabric. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Anna Rolader, our head of communications, who will be taking over uh, and guiding the conversation today. Anna has spent her career between journalism and the tech industry. She was a staff writer at Forbes.com in New York. And she's worked as a marketing manager for IRIN, a humanitarian news organization based in Geneva. Her roles in tech companies have included being an analyst and an editor at Gartner Research and working in marketing communications at Opera Software in Oslo, the maker of, Opware, int, uh, of Opera Internet Browser. Uh, really quickly, ground rules today uh, for uh, panelists. If you are new, introduce yourself. We're all webinar pros. Probably comes as uh, no need to say, but uh, I say it nonetheless. And participants, uh, thanks so much for joining us. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, if you have a question during the conversation, please put it in the chat function. Uh, I will be curating those and feeding them to Anna uh, as we go along. And with that, uh, I hit mute and turn it over to Anna. Thank you, Greg. Um, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar how technology is shaping the future of accountability journalism. And I'm really delighted to have this wonderful panel of speakers with us. I know that our, um, our hour is going to go by very fast, so I just want to um, give a couple of uh, sort of high level remarks to set, to set the pace here. Um, so our mission at Source Fabric is to create um, open source tools for journalism. But what it's really about for us is bridging the digital divide, meaning that we provide the technology needed by small and independent news organizations to be competitive with much larger market-driven media. And at the moment, we find ourselves in an environment where the very ability for news organizations to function as independent voices of accountability is in question. There are many individual threats to uh, press freedom today, but the main categories we see are financial pressure, government pressure, concentration of media ownership, and the proliferation of junk and fake news. And particularly now, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, we see all of those threats intensifying, which is really why we convened this webinar. So we're really looking forward to the insights that our panelists can share into this whole question of how technology can help public interest journalism to survive. So that starts with educating the next, journal, uh, the next generation of reporters. So with that, I'd like to start introducing our panelists, um, Mindy McAdams, who I believe is on the call, but maybe having trouble with her camera. Um, Mindy is the Knight Chair of Journalism Technologies and the Democratic Process at the University of Florida in the US, where she teaches digital journalism, code, news apps, and social media. Her book is called Flash Journalism, How to Create Multimedia News Packages. Welcome, Mindy, and can you tell us are you, is your mic working? Are you there? Okay, maybe we'll, we'll come back to Mindy, hopefully. So then our next panelist uh, in the field, Paul Radu, the co-founder and chief of innovation at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Network, OCCRP for short. Paul is the co-creator of several pioneering tools, including the investigative dashboard concept and visual investigative scenarios software. He has held a number of fellowships and is the recipient of many awards, including most recently the 2020 Sigma Data Journalism Award. Congratulations and welcome, Paul. Thank you and um, thank you very much for inviting. Looking forward. Great, we're really excited to have you. So now we move on to our next two panelists who are engaged in supporting and strengthening journalism in a variety of ways. Adam Thomas is the director of the European Journalism Center, a Dutch nonprofit aimed at building resiliency into European journalism. His previous roles included being chief product officer at Storyful and a stint for a while in my job, head of communications at Source Fabric. Welcome, Adam. Welcome back to Source Fabric. Thank you, it's nice to come home. <laughs> and finally, um, I'd like to introduce Mira Milosevic. 
Executive Director of the Global Forum for Media Development, where she leads GFMD's engagement with the United Nations, the Internet Governance Forum, and other multilateral institutions, as well as GFMD's international efforts advocating for the sustainability of journalism and news media. Welcome, Mira. Thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Great. And so um, with that, I'd really like to go right into our discussion. And um, maybe let's uh, start in the field with, with Paul. You're really working on the ground on these questions every day. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the journalistic needs that drove the creation of a tool like Dashboard, uh, which your co-founder, Drew Sullivan, calls a research desk for the world. And specifically, I was wondering, um, does a tool like this allow journalists with little to no technical skills to do data journalism, or is a certain amount of data literacy a prerequisite to use dashboard? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the investigative dashboard and all the tools that we developed at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project are tech tools designed around the investigative process. So, you know, um, I mean, there was all this hype, uh, you know, um, about hackathons, for instance, you know, um, at some point. And we turned that concept a bit in its head and we said investigatons. And that's, you know, the concept behind what we're doing at uh, OCCRP. Uh, we have journalism driving the tech, not the other way around, you know. And I think this is what, uh, what kind of help, helped us, you know, build a, a successful organization. So it all started when, you know, I mean, uh, it was more than 10 years ago now, all right? Um, and um, when we realized, you know, a group of journalists in Eastern Europe, we, we actually realized that uh, we were investigating the same thing over and over again. You know, corruption in all, in all its shapes and forms, it's always the same, you know? You have the high-powered people, you know, stealing money from the, from, from the people, you know, from, from, from the masses. Um, and there's tools in between, right, to, uh, to actually go about it, you know, offshore type of companies, lawyers, accountants, you know, very smart people, hackers, you know, sometimes helping these, these politicians, you know, and organized crime steal the money. So um, I was actually um, a bit more than 10 years ago, I was in Sierra Leone in Freetown, you know, working with the local journalists there. And um, the local journalists helped me a lot um, get to the bottom of a story where you know, oligarchs from Eastern Europe were investing in the mining industry in Sierra Leone. Now, you know, in the course of our work together, you know, um, this, this journalist asked me, so I'm, I'm, I'm helping you with this, but you know, um, I need some help too, because you're one instance of one oligarch from Eastern Europe coming into, you know, Sierra Leone to exploit minerals, you know, it's, 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 it's just one, you know, and um, there, there's many oligarchs from other places in the world that, that are doing the same thing. So how can you help me, you know, get down to the bottom of those stories? So this is how, you know, the idea of the investigative dashboard a research, uh, you know, kind of desk for the world was born because I realized, yeah, what, what we're doing is great, you know, at, at, at OCCRP, I, I think. I'm, I'm very proud of our work, but it's limited because we have limited, you know, um, resources and we're actually not that many, you know. So I think with this, the investigative dashboard was um, our initial attempt to assist the investigative reporters of the world and the activists, you know, interested in uh, investigating matters, you know, that were uh, of, of concern, you know, to better serve the public. Um, so this is how, how the investigative um, dashboard was, uh, was, was born out of need, out of journalistic need, and out of the realization that what we're doing as journalists is very little and there should be a lot more of it. That's great. Okay, Mindy, Mindy, you are able to join us. That's great. Ah, finally. Yes. <laughs> I had very weird connection problems since 830. I don't know why, but I'm here now. Nice to see you all. Nice. To, I'm so glad you could join us. Um, and actually, you know, Paul was just tell, telling us about the, um, the journalistic needs that have driven the development of tools like the investigative dashboard, um, helping journalists um, really work more together. Did you want to say any, any more about that, Paul? Uh, let me, I'm still arranging my screen and my volume is really low, so give me a minute. Okay, yeah, so, please. so Paul, please um, tell yeah, us. So, um, um, I can just, just add a few words about uh, the initial structure of the investigative dashboard because that's, you know, the, 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 the point from where we started all our other tech tools. 
um, that are much advanced, you know, right now compared to uh, when we started 10 years ago. So uh, there are three axes where we, uh, where we try to develop. One was assisting people with research and um, namely research on companies and offshore type of companies, you know, that, you know, that's information that was hard to get at that point in time and it's still hard to get. So research. Then the other one was, you know, to index as much data as possible to create a database that's meaningful, you know, for the world's journalists. And the other one was an axis where we tried to make this information more, uh, more digestible to people. And that was, you know, where we created these uh, tools to visualize uh, information. So, but all this was, was built on the back of, you know, investigative, uh, you know, mind power. It, 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 it was, you know, all our investigative reporters engaged with the investigative dashboard at Perth were people with a lot of experience, with a lot of context in their heads, and they were willing to put all this together, you know, in order to help other journalists elsewhere and activists, you know, um, be able to break, you know, like really, really big stories that were of, uh, you know, huge public, public interest. Mm -hmm. Great. And what do you find, I mean, you said that people are coming to this with a lot of contextual knowledge, you know, are they bringing technical skills as well, or is it really something that is meant to, to kind of, um, you know, uh, offer that sort of instant ability to, to crunch data and visualize it for people? It's um, um, a lot of the people, you know, that were in initially involved with um, the investigative dashboard were not tech people, but as we, as we went on, you know, uh, we realized, you know, that we need, we needed skilled people to, to be able to further develop, you know, these, these, these tools. And right now, you know, I think the mindset uh, with OCCRP is that most investigative reporters that work with us, you know, have um, a good level of knowledge, but at the same time, they realize that they need the help of professionals. It's a combo of, you know, our, our developer right now when it comes to our data services and Aleph, you know, Friedrich uh, Lindenberg and, and, and many others. So is this combination, but always on the back of work, always on the back that these tools and this data need to be useful to investigative processes. Great. Okay. So I think that that's actually a good segue to go back to Mindy. Um, so maybe, you know, could you tell us, what do you think are kind of the minimum skills of data literacy or where do you start with students your journalism students in kind of inculcating this this mindset of being able to do work like uh like occ rp is doing someday uh i think your sound you're you're uh, okay there we go <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's always the one who talks about technology who has the most technological problems. Um, with students, um, we feel like there is a minimum amount uh, that all journalism students should learn. So they should know um, uh, like basic descriptive statistics. So, you know, they should be able to um, just identify, you know, uh, uh, they should know enough to be able to have a, a reaction to a study or a survey or a poll to say, mm, I don't think these data look sufficient or look like they were analyzed correctly. So that's a thing that hasn't always been taught to journalists, but I think that's now a basic. Um, they should be able to work with data that's in rows and columns, you know, whether that's a spreadsheet or a database, uh, depending on, you know, their level or what they're trying to work with. Um, they should be able to work with people who can do data analysis, even if they don't know enough to perform data analysis themselves. And then coding is, uh, not every journalist needs to be able to code to the level where uh, they could produce something with code but i think it's really helpful if journalists have had a little experience with code like even if it was a high school class or something like that so they understand how much it's not magic and how much it is possible for people to fail Right. So, for example, like when you're seeing some kind of data analysis, 
you want to be able to ask the questions um, or, you know, find somebody to help you ask the questions. Is this valid? You know, was this conducted in a proper data science way? Or are these numbers some kind of spin that a political figure, a government official is putting on these data? Right. So I think, you know, that's where we are now. Um, it has a lot to do with the data themselves uh, rather than, oh, I need to know this tool or this technology or I need to be able to, you know, write Python. Hmm. So when, you, when you're talking also about um, kind of uh, seeing through the data, um, so what part of it, the other, the other part that you teach I've seen in your courses is building uh, applications that's, that scrape data and kind of put things together. Um, is that kind of the other part of it where you see journalists needing to kind of create a counter narrative through, through the data that they can, they can assemble? Well, I think a lot of times uh, the data that journalists assemble and offer to the public with some kind of interface, like a searchable database, those data were not available before. So sometimes the journalists obtain the data through um, uh, uh, freedom of information requests, right? But sometimes they need to scrape it, either because it's been denied to them or... Um, just because they're told, oh, this is on our website, but it's not in a very usable form. So the journalist with a certain skill set will say, well, if I scrape that data, put it into a database um, or even just a, you know, a, a JSON file, which is JavaScript, um, I can make it available to the public in a really easy way. And an example of that, I was trying to think of examples. So ProPublica did a, um, a project, oh, I think it came out at the end of last year, and it's called Credibly Accused. And it's about Catholic priests who've been accused of some kind of sexual abuse. And what they found was something like, um, actually, I have the numbers if I scroll my document a little bit. They found that um, 178 separate lists existed of these priests. So the Catholic Church as a global organization never made one big list, right? But in the United States, there were 78 separate lists. And so ProPublica collected all the lists, put them together in one database, and if you want to search that database because you or a relative might have been affected, um, there's just one search box. Like, and in that box, you can type the name of the priest, the name of the diocese, or I think the, the, town, the city, the city. So you can type either one of those three things in one box, hit a search button, and see if that priest or that diocese is in the 178 lists. And then if you find a particular priest who you wanna look at his record, you can click that and you can get all the data that's available about him from a particular list. And that information was not available to the public at all before. And of course, what it allows is, um, if you wonder if the priest who you're familiar with now was accused somewhere else in the past, was he one of these priests who were moved from one church to another, right? Um, you can now find that out for yourself. And so I feel, you know, that's a great public service. It's something that neither the church nor the government nor the police were providing to anyone. And it wasn't available. The important thing is it wasn't available in a usable form before because the 178 separate lists were all different from each other. They have different formatting and, and like how would a regular person ever get all 178? Yeah, I think that's a really great example. And it, it, Sounds to me actually also just going back to Paul, like it sounds similar to a lot of the work that you have to do kind of piecing things together and, and information that's fragmented and, and hidden in, in some way. And so 
with OCCRP, uh, you know, your slogan being, it takes a network to fight a network. I wondered what have you learned from following organized crime syndicates um, in term, and, and how has that informed the tech that you use to do journalism, especially in terms of your communications and your security? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're in constant uh, touch with uh, uh, organized crime, right? Uh, we do have to, to, to talk to these people. And uh, um, what's, what's really worrying when you cover organized crime and corruption is that you realize the extent of it and you realize how tech savvy these people are. I'd say they're a bit, you know, ahead of us when it comes to technology. Um, I'd say they're about uh, maybe 10 years ahead of us you know, when it comes to using the technology, employing, uh, you know, technological setups that are very, very costly. Um, and, you know, a, a few years back, uh, we looked um, in Eastern Europe at um, the ownership of ISPs, internet service providers. And one of the conclusions of that um, uh, investigations back then that covered, I think, uh, 12 countries was that there's huge infiltration of organized crime in the ISP ownership. Um, now that's that's continued, you know, um, that's continued and unfortunately what we're seeing is, you know, um, criminals and large criminal groups uh, managing and, you know, organizing their own server farms, uh, offering hosting services um, and, you know, to people that are not even aware that they're using the, 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 the services of these of this, uh, this criminals. And sometimes it's for simple reasons, you know, they offer, you know, um, possibilities to pay in Bitcoin, you know, and people just jump at that opportunity and that's, that, that's fine. Except, except the problem is when you don't check, you know, who's offering you, you know, the, the cheap hosting, you know, and who's promising, you know, all this, uh, you know, huge uptime and all that kind of stuff. I think, you know, I mean, um, wh what we're actually seeing is server farms where you have airports, where you have banks, where you have ordinary people hosting their blogs and all that, but the server farms are owned by criminals who are collecting this data. So I'd say, you know, that uh, what we're seeing right now is, you know, a collection era for organized crime. I mean, these people are, are collecting so much data. I don't think they know yet what to do with, with all of this, you know? I mean, there's efforts here and there, you know, to mine for compromise, you know, but there are efforts uh, here and there. We're seeing, you know, them hosting all sorts of, um, you know, forums where, you know, the discussions are between Nazis sometimes, sometimes but between other, other you know, um, uh, other people, you know, with interests outside of the public interest and so on. So um, it's also, I mean, when, when, you, when you start communicating with, uh, with criminals, you also see how much they know about secure, secure comms, you know. Um, I mean, they're using very, very sophisticated ways, you know, that are, you know, um, uh, and setups, you know, uh, obviously they're using, you know, uh, you know, things like signal, you know, that everybody's using, right? Um, but they, they go uh, beyond that, you know, they go again, they're using their server structure. Uh, and uh, so I think, you know, they're very, very sophisticated. And I think that's, that's going to be a very interesting point, you know, to investigate, you know, right now, because you know, if, if we don't realize all this, we're all going to be prey to, you know, large organized crime groups that move from drug trafficking because they had so much money, you know, billions and hundreds of billions at their disposal into exploiting, you know, digital, you know, uh, information and your digital information and, and all. So I think that's, that's, I mean, people are not that much focused on, on the criminals, but criminals are a lot more advanced, I think, than journalists and the methods that, that they're employing are, are scary. That is really, it's very concerning. Um, and thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And I think that's actually a good point to, to kind of shift gears a little bit, because I, I feel like if, if I'm thinking as, you know, as I was preparing for this webinar, kind of the way I was looking at, or, or what it seemed to me that the technologies that can support uh, public interest journalism kind of fall into two categories. And one is this technology, these technologies of corroboration which uh, you, Paul, were just talking about, and Mindy, you were also sharing like, how journalism can, can uh, bring these, uh, you know, can, can do this, gather data and, and report in the public interest. Um, but then the other side, there's technologies of collaboration. And um, I think it seems 
uh, particularly important now that that journalists can kind of work together for for all sorts of reasons. So with that, I wondered, uh, Mira, you know, given that you really have a global um, kind of remit in your job, if you could maybe tell us what you see in terms of collaborations emerging in maybe parts of the world that we don't always hear about, or interesting projects that you know, that are that are coming together now, and, and if possible, what what kinds of technologies are supporting them? Uh, thank you, Anna, and um, thank you, Paul and Mindy. That was uh, really interesting, and and is in line with our thinking that um, uh, technology does influence uh, how the future of accountability journalism will be shaped, but that we also need to think of ways how uh, can we influence those technologies, especially at the level of architecture, decision-making values and principles, um, and how these will be, be built in the future, how we as a journalism and, uh, and media community can, can impact uh, that to actually be a space that will work for accountability uh, journalism and for accountability to all citizens. So what we do is we try to create these spaces within some international um, policy and the regional and national uh, decision uh, making uh, platforms so that we can come with the knowledge that Paul has just presented, with the knowledge uh, we have from, from Europe, from Adam and, and his partners, uh, for, from you and your partners uh, in Source Fabric, and go to, to these decision-making uh, circles such as IGF, uh, and try to bring the perspective uh, of uh, journalism and how journalism can survive and thrive, hopefully, in these uh, digital spaces. So some of the examples, I um, mean, there are two, two areas where we focus. The first is to create the spaces and platforms. The second is, of course, to to uh, facilitate cooperation and collaboration along the lines of uh, uh, you need to fight networks with networks. Um, and uh, a couple of things that we are doing at the moment is uh, uh, we have a dynamic coalition in the Internet Governance Forum where we bring journalists from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, but also US and, uh, and uh, Western Europe at the moment, uh, to, to give examples of how they're trolled, how they're attacked, doxed, uh, what are the issues that they're facing with security, what are those mechanisms that allow organized crime to, to own these, uh, these uh, IPSs, um, et cetera, but also to see what are the aspects of uh, uh, financial viability that you mentioned, Anna. What are uh, uh, the structures that are allowing or more often not allowing uh, accountability journalism to be valued and to, to have its own kind of uh, uh, sustainability online. So one of the things that we are doing at the moment, we are uh, looking at uh, um, uh, Digital Services Act in, uh, in Europe um, and the consultation process is uh, in place and uh, from the perspective of accountability one of the questions in the 60 page uh, consultation survey is what information should competent authorities make publicly available um, about their surveillance and enforcement. So these are the things that we will try to kind of look at from the perspective of journalism. So we are also looking at Santa Clara principles that uh, uh, are self-regulatory documents from big platforms about content takedowns. So if uh, Paul is working on a story of Mindis or Mindis uh, students for you know, three months and uh, um, they use a lot of resources to produce it, there needs to be a certain procedure that will be followed if someone wants to, to take that content down. Um, so this is another, another area where collaboration is really important. From the tech perspective, we are, uh, we are um, looking to provide this uh, community of practice to, to connect all our members in Source Fabric, European Journalism Center, and OCCRP are our members to share uh, the knowledge about all these tools uh, and provide journalism organizations and journalists with, with knowledge so that they don't have to go to the most popular, the most commercial 
um, uh, products that uh, are not respecting maybe in all cases uh, the human rights principles, uh, uh, privacy, and uh, are not transparent about their uh, terms of service. So those are some of the things we believe in the power of, uh, of collective uh, action. We have launched uh, a call for support to journalism um, in the context of COVID, uh, together with uh, around 180 organizations. And, um, and finally, we think it's a, it's a breaking point in time at the moment, the same as we had uh, the creation of journalism ethics as a reaction to Penny and Yellow Press, the same as we had the uh, fairness doctrine in the US being developed uh, as a reaction to what happened during the Second World War. We think it's at the right time for us to be talking about new ethical principles of uh, accountability uh, and journalism and information in, in online spaces. Some of the things that uh, OCCRP is doing uh, are, are fantastic. For instance, the collaboration is happening at the moment uh, with OCCRP and the um, uh, Arab Journalism Investigative Network and uh, GAGN and uh, International Consortium to support, for instance, what Maria Reza and Rappler are doing in Philippines. And, uh, uh, you know, it's been facilitated and uh, enabled by technology they're all using. Um, there is a, a collaboration going on at the moment in Brazil where um, local journalism organizations are collecting data on COVID um, infections because the, the state has stopped publishing uh, these data. And, uh, you know, investigative journalists and accountability journalism is helping this. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives uh, that our members are implementing at the moment, so I can, I can talk about that uh, a bit later. Great, great. And we are um, we are always so impressed with the work uh, that you do, really presenting this kind of united, you know, like re representing journalism to to these other organizations. I think is so is so valuable. Um, and I wanted to touch on uh, two of the things you mentioned. One thing was um, uh, sharing knowledge of tools that may not be widely known, and this collective action for COVID, and then maybe bring Adam into the conversation and. Adam, uh, recently the uh, EJC has launched a couple of initiatives uh, responding to the crisis. Uh, the COVID Collaboration Wire launched with Hostwriter, and then more recently the free, um, Freelance Assembly, Freelance Journalism Assembly. And these are both very new initiatives. I think um, the Hostwriter initiative was in May and the Freelance Assembly just a few weeks ago. So it's, it's very early days, and, but I was wondering if you could just I was just curious about your thoughts. I mean, these are these are wonderful, very rapidly spun up uh, responses to an acute crisis. But how do you see them evolving, perhaps into longer term supports for the media? Yeah, I think, you know, both of these projects actually uh, have a life long before COVID-19 and were somehow evolved very, very quickly. So I think it it shows that the journalism and, and the organizations working within it at the minute are able to rapidly evolve things and, and listen to the needs of users or the needs of the field to be able to develop new software and, and new techniques together. So for us, I mean, I think both of those projects in particular, they, they, what they indicate is actually a real change in how we're thinking about how we design programs these days. And, and I think a lot of that community is a practice right now. I think we're at a really uh, we're a really dangerous point for journalism in terms of its sustainability and its and its resilience. And so one of the ways forward, I think, is to really empower communities of practice, especially with journalists, to be able to start to solve these problems themselves and come together. And the way I see the European Journalism Centre is really a site for doing a lot of that work. And I think we're seeing very, very exciting things happen in that regard. Uh, we had 900 freelance journalists sign up to our, to our programme in the last, what was it, two or three weeks. And we launched our first webinar yesterday with well, it was more of an interactive workshop with 100 people involved. So we're just seeing a real need like journalists themselves feel like they have to get together and start to fix some of their own problems because they can't sit around and wait for other people to do it. And that's exactly the kind of spirit that Paul and, and, and other successful teams have shown that if you, you know, uh, find a way or make one to kind of quote a source fabric phrase from the past, which is really, you know, journalists are having to, to build their own thing. So I think that's the first thing is this communities of practice is a really important thing. And then secondly, of course, collaboration comes, comes together a lot, you know, 
where as information becomes more globalized and journalism becomes more globalized, some of the traditional boundaries between newsrooms that are inherently competitive start to break down. And I think we can start to see more open collaborations. And we see investigations like the type that Paul runs at Panama Papers, et cetera. You know, these are all reliant now on major international collaborations of journalists that firstly weren't possible because of the technology, but secondly, perhaps because of a mindset. And I think that's one of the strongest areas that we start to see things change here. So these aren't necessarily technological changes, but they're definitely mindset changes. And I think some of them are born of, a, of product thinking, uh, you know, ideas of rapidly testing and prototyping and developing product, which has come into newsrooms in the last 10 years or so. I think some of this is about computational thinking, which is about journalists getting much better at being able to think, how can we use computers to solve problems? And I think that's something that Mindy alluded to, you know, that type of thinking should be taught in all universities. You don't have to code, but you need to be able to think, how would a computer solve this problem? How can I work with someone with expertise to solve this problem? So I think we're seeing a number of shifts of mindset education as well that really complements the type of technology. And as, you know, as the, the bad guys get more sophisticated, as the data sets get bigger, we not only need improvements on the technological side, but of course we need them on the, on the collaboration and thinking side. And, and what I'm hoping at the EJC anyway, is that we're building a, a supportive environment for that. Well, that's, yes. And I think that's so important and you're doing such a, such a, a key um, public service in that way. And that, that gets into kind of a broader question I wanted to put to all of you, which is that, to me, it really seems like right now what we're what we're seeing is that there are these there's these institutional forces arrayed against journalism on one side. You have everything from governments to organized crime networks to corporate legal departments who are increasingly are going after uh, journalists for various reasons on the one side. And then on the other side, this landscape, especially of independent journalists, which is very fragmented. Um, you know, you have freelancers, you have small news organizations. Um, and I mean, Adam, I think you started to talk about this with communities of practice, and I, I would like to hear you say more about that. Um, but really, I would be, I would like to hear kind of from all of you about what you think the pieces are that could help journalists really make common cause, uh, join forces and do more effective work for journalism. I don't know, Adam, maybe you can say a little bit more about communities of practice, because I feel like maybe not everyone knows what that means. Yeah, sure. You're, thank you for jargon busting. I should have, uh, should have explained that. I mean, it's a, I think it's a, a process or a term that we're all familiar with innately somehow, which is just when communities who are trying to solve a problem together or have a common interest come together to solve that problem themselves and then think about sharing the learning with inside that group and then more broadly. So it's nothing hugely groundbreaking. You know, this is a term that really goes back to the 50s and 60s, I think, in, in terms of sociology, but it's really a very effective way of learning. And I think it becomes more and more important in this current environment that we start to think about that as a form of education, that we start to think of, of, of co-development and collaboration as absolutely the core of journalism education, but also the future of the industry going forward. So when you think about that, I think the other thing to then think about is, you know, we talk about public interest and, and we haven't sp spoken about the public too much here. And that's obviously key is, you know, we spend a lot of time as an industry inward looking and we have to change a lot. I don't think we're thinking enough about the public still here. And what do the public need to know? What do the public want to know? And when we think about a, a you know, a community of practice, how can we develop a community of practice that then also involves our audiences? So that we're reporting with those audiences, not about them. We're reporting kind of for them, not on them. Mm. And these come back to principles of engaged journalism for me, which is really asking citizens, what do they want to know and involving them in that process um, as much as possible. And this can obviously be crowdsourcing, but it can also be really engaging them for, for tips, for story ideas, for things that they want to understand about their politicians and, and who and what they want to be held accountable. But there's several things that journalists have to change before they do that. And, and there's several things that we've seen, I think, in recent weeks that have to change around this. And, and of course, Black Lives Matter has really brought this sharply into focus that we need to think a lot more about diversity inside of newsrooms. You know, if you look at some of the data coming out of Germany at the minute, you know, 25% of, of people in Germany have some kind of immigration background, but only two to 5% of journalists are uh, how share that background of an immigration background. So we have fundamental problems inside newsrooms that we have to fix. Um, that if we don't make our newsrooms more representative, we're always going to be failing to represent and inform the public in the fullest way possible. 
Um, and then secondly, it's about that mindset of thinking of our public or thinking about our audience as part of that community of practice, as someone that we can work with. And that extends to the reporting, but then it also expands, you know, it extends to the investigations, but then it also extends out into how we distribute that, how we engage people in that news. And I think one thing that we have seen from COVID-19 is, is news organizations have got much better at community calls, virtual town halls, running WhatsApp groups, all of these types of things to really try and engage people more deeply in the work that they do. And long term, that's where the survive, you know, survivability of the of, of the media industry is going to come from because that's going to be what uh, helps uh, justify the value of journalism and helps people pay for journalism ultimately. That's great. That's great. Yes. Um, so maybe Mindy, could you maybe say something about that too? I mean, in your you know, you're 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 dealing with digital natives, and um, you know your students have grown up kind of already in a different world. Do you find that you need to teach them this kind of thing, or do they just come in kind of knowing? How to engage people on social media or what I mean yeah tell us tell us kind of what you're seeing it 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 varies a lot because among students um, I, I feel like people who don't teach in universities and journalism schools don't always realize that not all students who sign up to study journalism uh, actually want to be any kind of traditional journalist and so sometimes um, uh, they're, they're not comfortable going out and interviewing people face to face. Um, they're not comfortable cold calling people on the phone, right? So these are things that, you know, not every student in, who's chosen journalism has really chosen to be a traditional reporter. And so this is why, you know, um, I agree with everything Adam was saying, and also the idea that not just that we need to report more for our communities, for what they really need to know and what they're interested in knowing, but we need to report more with them, right? Like with them as our collaborators. And then that opens up other kinds of ideas because, um, the people in the community aren't always comfortable with us. And so this is a thing we see too with students. The students go out and they're doing this for the first time and, and they're uncomfortable going into a community they've never been in, right? Um, and even, I'm not even talking about like racial and cultural differences as much as the student is from another part of the state of Florida and they're here in our county and it might be very different from where they came from. And they go into a community that they are unfamiliar with and they're uncomfortable and the people talking with them are uncomfortable. And sometimes the people talking with a student are uncomfortable because the student looks so young, right? And, and so the people in the community don't really feel trust for them, right? So there's all kinds of issues that, uh, we talk about at journalism conferences, right? Um, but mm, I feel like there there needs to be a lot more intermingling and and between communities and journalists and talking about these really feelings that people have, you know, when they're trying to talk to strangers, when the community members are trying to put trust in a stranger whom, who they may fear will misquote them or misrepresent their, their concerns, or even them as people, right, who, who might feel like their community will be misrepresented because maybe it has been in the past. And one other thing I want to address related to what Adam said, the data journalists in particular uh, often see themselves as a community, you know, of people who have these, this certain skill set. And they are very willing to help each other, uh, very willing to, you know, sort of even do work for others, provide resources, you know, send me your data and I'll see if I can help you with that problem you described. And so organizations, you know, in addition to the EJC, which is a great organization and has great training, um, the Investigative Reporters and Editors is another organization that has, um, 
you know, uh, Slack, uh, you know, Slack board for the data journalists and a listserv for everybody. And people are really willing, willing to help, you know, have you ever worked with a data set in this format? How do I work with it? I've got this giant collection of PDFs that I have to uh, scan and analyze, you know, what's the best way to do that? I never did it before. And people are really generous with their time and their knowledge. And another key point across organizations. So for most of my life, these newspapers in particular in the U S have seen each other as uh, seen one another as um, uh, the competition right? The whole idea of they're my competition, so I shouldn't share with them. I should scoop them. I should beat them. I should have the story first. I should keep my information secret from them so they don't steal my story, right? And that has changed a lot just, you know, in the past several years, particularly as we've lost a lot of jobs in this industry and so forth. But I feel like more journalists and particularly younger journalists are more open to sharing knowledge and even sharing you know, data and skills with people who work for another organization, you know, whether it's in the same town, the same city, or you know, in a separate uh, newspaper chain or news organization. So you know, we have these giant conglomerates and you work for this one and I work for that one, but you know, behind the scenes, we're going to help each other analyze this data and maybe even share the data and run it, you know, each of us run it in our own separate publications or broadcast it. That's really interesting and, and hopeful. Mm. Um, and maybe we could come back to Mira. You said that there were, you, you were talking about some of these, these groups in particular that you could give us kind of more examples of of these collaborations and um, knowledge sharing coming together? Um, <clears throat> we have created a, a number of groups and participate in a number of groups that uh, discuss all these, uh, these issues. Um, so one of the groups uh, that, uh, that we run is uh, uh, this Internet Governance Forum group where uh, you know, we bring people together to, to report uh, on, on, on all these issues. And uh, for instance, one of the things that, that is coming uh, at the moment is the uh, International Journalism Center has uh, um, tools and resources for reporting on COVID uh, um, in, I think, uh, six languages. So that's something that we share within, within these groups. Uh, more importantly, on, uh, for us, on a policy level, one of the groups that uh, participates in our Internet Governance Forum is a, a free press uh, from the U.S. that has just calculated that over the last 15 years, local journalists alone have lost around between 850 million to 1.2 billion in wages only. And so they calculate that local journalism in the U.S. has lost around maybe 20,000 jobs. Uh, this is something that, uh, if we speak about the impact of technology on future journalism, is one of the core areas where we bring uh, uh, people together to work towards addressing this. Um, we estimated that the situation on a global level is fivefold to what we're seeing in the U.S. So if we're speaking only on, uh, about local reporters, local accountability reporters, in traditional uh, sense uh, of, uh, of the word, uh, we probably have lost over the last 15 to 20 years around 100,000 reporting jobs, uh, at, least, uh, at least globally. So uh, if we are talking about future accountability journalism, this is something that we feel we have to urgently address to find the model that will allow these people to do their jobs and have wages um, beyond uh, you know, uh, finding small models that work in certain, in certain situations. So this community of practice of sharing what works uh, is something that you also do with uh, with source public and uh, and different uh, and uh, different uh, tools and uh, technical solutions that you're using. One of the things that we also feel is important is uh, uh, for engagement with audiences is how do you actually measure and receive signals from these audiences? How do you go be beyond Google Analytics and how do you really have 
uh, signals that, uh, that tell you how much your audience engages. But on the other side, what single signals are you sending to, to, to big platforms uh, about the quality of your work and how, how do platforms and the digital spaces uh, tell the difference between uh, credible accountability journalists uh, and, um, and the noise that's, uh, uh, that's dominating uh, our conversations. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, we are working with groups like Media Diversity Institute, uh, that uh, at the moment um, they are also our members are looking at um, uh, the situation that Adam uh, mentioned in our newsrooms and what are the, the tools and resources that we can all use to, to improve uh, this situation, both in terms of representation, uh, diversity reporting and re recognition of the problems that we have, but also in terms of uh, sustainability. How do we uh, keep these jobs? How do we bring in new jobs? And how do we continue to, to have the ability to report on corruption, to report and hold these uh, in power to account? And with that, I would actually put the question to Paul, um, since you're kind of in the hot seat in this, in, in this way. I mean, I mean, I think OCCRP is a great example of journalists collaborating amongst your member centers to kind of create this unified picture. But, um, you know, what about making, building trust with the public um, and also what uh, we've, we've been talking about in terms of um, what do journalists have to change kind of amongst themselves and in terms of the mindset to, to be a united front, as it were? So, um, look, I mean, my opinion is that while the general situation with journalism is, you know, dire, I mean, uh, you know, journalism uh, overall is not in a, in a good place uh, because of many reasons. Um, I think when it comes to investigative reporting, there has never been in the past 100 years, you know, a place as good for investigative reporting as it is now. Uh, and I'm talking here about, I mean, just think about all the centers for investigative reporting that popped up, you know, that mushroomed all over the world, you know, in the past 10 years. There have never been in any traditional newsroom, you know, as many investigative reporters. Investigative reporting was in traditional newsrooms, a site uh, work, you know, which was, you know, for like, you know, people who were in high regard in the newsroom, of course, but they would produce very little, you know, from time to time. Again, I mean, uh, excellent, uh, uh, you know, articles and all that, but it was very, very limited. So I think we're still limited, but better that, than we used to be, you know, so there's a lot more investigative reporting and there's a lot more focus because the investigative reporter and, you know, used to be like a grasshopper, you know, jumping from topic to topic, you know, from subject to subject, you know, and then you'd, you know, today you'd tackle, you know, trafficking in human beings and tomorrow you'd, you know, um, uh, tackle some other issue that, you know, um, high school kind of dropouts and all that. And that's all good. Except I think investigative reporting is really efficient when it builds up, when it builds on previous experiences. When the tech that's built to help investigative reporting, you know, it's added on top of those experiences. And I think that's what we're witnessing right now. So uh, I'll give you one example. When we, you know, so this was a, a couple of days ago when we talked with all these media organizations uh, around the world to uh, start this initiative, you know, to work al alongside Maria Ressa and Rappler, you know, and to, you know, kind of continue their, their work and all that. Uh, one, of the, one of the discussions in that group, and again, this involves many, you know, investigative outlets all over the world, was what tools to pick you know, to use for, you know, to, to exchange data and, uh, you know, comb and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't, I mean, everybody had their own tools. They worked so much in the past 10 years to develop, you know, and to, you know, create their own wikis and their own secure channels and their own data analysis tools and all that. It's amazing. I mean, if you tried this project 10 years ago, you know, you'd be like, what can we use? You know, we don't know about these tools, you know? So this is, you know, this is something that changed quite a bit. Now, this comes with, with lots of problems as well, you know, and you're right to address the public trust. And I, I think um, the problem, the main problem right now is that, you know, you're offering to the public, you know, very good content, quality content, you know, that tackles with issues that are of public interest. And then what we're seeing, for instance, at OCCRP and um, at, uh, at the centers that are part of OCCRP is that 
the public comes back and says, oh, but you should also deal with this problem and with this problem and, and with this problem. And lots of those problems are iteration of what you already offered as context, as investigative reporting, except you can't tackle all those problems. Mm -hmm. And then the public, you know, gets disengaged from, from your effort because you didn't help them on that as well. So this is, I think, where we need to work right now, you know, uh, to realize investigative reporting is great, but it's limited. We need more people to be able to use these tools, to, use, uh, to, to be able to use context. You know, we, we need a lot more technology to be able to develop patterns because what we investigated just now, like in Kenya, for instance, is the same that you can investigate in Peru or in Romania, my own country or, or, or elsewhere, except people don't, don't really see this, you know? But I think that's growing and that's changing, you know, with this big collapse, you know, cross borders, you know, with, with changing. So I think, journalists are becoming more humble and that means they're becoming more prone to cooperate across borders you know we're seeing high level newsrooms cooperating now with smaller initiatives in countries that were not even considered before so this is really really great actually when it comes to investigative uh, reporting at least you know okay that's great and and you're actually getting into my final question for the for the group which was we are in our final 5 minutes which was to ask each of you, is there something specific that gives you hope right now for the future of accountability journalism? So, so Paul, would that be sort of what you would put forward as your more humility and more uh, and better tech or what would you, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, I think more humility and uh, more cooperation, you know, based on that and based on the recognition that we need to serve the public better and we need to, you know, give the public the, the right tools for them to do the investigation, you know? Um, that's 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 one of the things, and the other is that um, you know my my I mean we're relying so much on government generated data, and we're all talking about you know access to information and all that, and that's great, but we need to take action you know on that front as well. So and I'm seeing that to some extent. I'm seeing you know people moving a bit more into sensor journalism, you know, planting your own sensors to track down flights, you know. And, uh, you know, having your own sensors to, to see the, 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 the quality of water and, 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 and these sort of efforts are very interesting because we don't always have to rely on governments, especially when, you know, we're working across borders and when, when organized crime is so much across borders and kleptocrats work across borders very, very well. So we need to, to, to do more on that front, but we're, I, I think we're advancing bit by bit. Great. Um, Adam, what, what would, what's your sort of specific grounds for hope? I think if you look at COVID-19 and the reporting that's been around that recent, recently, there's been so much incredible reporting, whether you're looking at something like the Washington Post data visualization or some of the really deep data work that's been going on at the Financial Times, which is taking what is pretty complicated data that could be represented in multiple ways and making that accessible for audiences outside of a paywall as well, which I think is great. So I think the reporting there has been amazing. The data and the collaborations have been great, but also it's had really deep impact. You know, we've had, you know, in the UK where I'm from, it has fundamentally changed government policy and held into account uh, some of the reporting that's been done. So I think we've seen journalism fulfilling its mission in such an intense way in COVID-19. And I think we've seen public recognition of that as well. You know, if you look at the digital news report from Reuters, you see that some of that trust starts to come back in certain areas. Um, and so I think that's, that's something that is, is something we should hold on to and build on. Wonderful. Um, Mindy, what would, what would your response to that be? Well, I wanted to uh, throw in the idea of um, artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, as a two-edged sword, right? Um, I think there are cases now where I had mentioned, you know, scanning PDFs, where you, um, it's, it may be government data, it may be corporate data, it may be health data, but where you collect all this stuff and, you know, it hasn't been prepackaged or given to you by an organization. So you've got way too much stuff for humans to deal with, particularly the reduced size of newsrooms, right? Um, so you use technology to, for example, scan the PDFs and make them human readable or, you know, turn using optical character recognition, right? So now it's text that can be read by a machine and that means uh, things can be selected from it, right? And this is just one example. It's not only documents, but it's an easy example, I think, to understand that if you can train 
a machine learning system, right, an AI, on what makes a document interesting to us. And this was done with uh, the Atlanta Journal Constitution's um, examination of uh, sexual abuse by doctors of patients, right? So humans figured out some key terms that would appear in complaints against doctors um, and said, okay, so go through this giant amount of scan documents and pinpoint for us, the humans, which ones we should look at, which ones look likely to contain a case we should investigate, right? And so in that way, you can go through hundreds of thousands of documents, but of course, certain expertise and so forth is required. And of course, mistakes can be made. But the example that I just gave is one where um, what you're really asking for is cut through the ridiculously large quantity for me machine learning system and show me documents that I should pay closer attention to. And then I, as the human, I can decide, okay, no, that one wasn't really worth looking at. Ah, this is the stack that we should investigate, right? And so I think we've got tools now and journalists who are learning to use them that were never available to us before for all the same reasons that business and so forth are looking at artificial intelligence systems, right? We've had changes in technology that have made these systems um, uh, more usable, more, more practical, right? Um, 50 years ago, it was like crazy stuff people were doing with AI, right? Now there's very, very practi practical stuff that people, journalists, um, researchers who are not in computer scientists, uh, not in computer science, right? Social scientists, humanities professors are using various forms of machine learning to analyze in particular texts and documents, but also images. And then one, I know a little long, but uh, the, the bad sword, of course, is many mistakes can be made. And I think everybody should be paying attention to uh, everything that's being written about facial recognition, right? Because that is one of the most problematic areas right now to use facial recognition technology to identify people as some kind of threat or wrongdoer and they're being wrongly identified, right? Because, uh, you know, a system that's made of code can be flawed and many of them are. So we have to be you know, knowledgeable and ethical about how we employ these systems. And we have to be transparent as journalists about how we're using them. So I've been very, very encouraged to see that a lot of journalism organizations are now publishing their methodology. So this is, last point, there's accountability journalism where we are holding the powerful to account, but there is also journalistic accountability where we hold ourselves to account and we are transparent about how we looked at the data, what tools we used, and you know what possible problems there might be in our analysis. That's a great point. Thank you for thank you for raising that. Um, and with that, uh, coming back to journalists and journalists kind of looking at themselves and as a group, uh, Mira, what what is your what are your grounds for hope? Uh, my biggest hope is that uh, those communities of practice and those networks uh, uh, like uh, OCCRP uh, are growing and there are more of them. And um, I think that those are uh, the only um, sustainable solutions for us to address both uh, uh, you know, the needs of our citizens and audiences, but also big, big policy decisions and, and questions that are facing us in the future. And just to close, I will quote uh, Maria Reza that we mentioned a couple of times today. Know that no matter how much of a superstar you are, you cannot accomplish anything meaningful alone. Build and strengthen your community. Rapplers build communities of action, I just hope it's enough to protect our democracy. Well, those are beautiful words and I don't think we could finish on a stronger note. Um, 
So thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, thanks all of you uh, for joining us today. It's been a really interesting conversation. I enjoyed it immensely and we, um, we have been recording this. We will make it available to anyone who wasn't able to join. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye-bye.